This week's episode of Offworld is made possible by Emerald Code on Sorta TV. Emerald Code is a series about teenage friends as they solve problems using STEM concepts. In the latest season, the gang heads off to space camp and conduct some pretty funky experiments. If you're a teacher or a parent, this is an amazing way to get preteens and young women in your life into the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Emerald Code. Get with the programming. Welcome back to Off World, the show where we talk about all things space exploration and pop culture. I'm Ariel Waldman. And I'm Norm Chan. And on today's episode, we are talking about a trope and a topic that you may have heard about, black holes. Yeah, objects of mysterious, what, who knows what. People imagine all sorts of wackadoodle things about black holes, about things that you can sort of pop into, things where you might be destroyed, wormholes. It's been a source of inspiration, I think it's safe to say, for uh, science fiction writers and filmmakers for a very long time. And in popular media, one of the first films to bring the idea of black holes into mainstream consciousness was The Black Hole, a Disney live action film from 1979. Yeah, it was one of the last films to really do everything, I think, in manual effects. So the visualizations of it, I personally loved it. It's that right, it strikes that right balance of like cheesy, uh, cheesy old movie, but really has some adorable bits with robots and the way they visualize spaceships and spaceship interfaces. I thought it was personally pretty cool. And of course, a depiction of a black hole. Yeah, which gets really trippy at the end, as you would imagine, in 1979. So today we're talking about both the black hole, the 1979 movie. We're also talking about more modern depictions, such as Interstellar, which is less trippy and more... I guess, I don't know, a lot of time dilation, a lot of Matthew McConaughey, a lot of love as an extra dimension. <laughs> it's a little bit different. I don't, I'm not sure scientists have that pinned down quite yet. Yeah. Well, to help demystify some of that, we have a great guest. So let's just jump to the conversation. So we're talking about black holes today, and we have a really, really awesome guest. Please uh, introduce yourself and what it is exactly that you do. Uh, hi, should I introduce myself to you or to the camera? Either one. Um, I'm Fatima Abdurrahman. I'm a third year grad student at UC Berkeley in the astronomy department, and I study black holes. Yeah, like so we're talking about black holes today. Norm, are you excited for this one? Yeah, especially in since black holes have been portrayed in popular media, movies and TVs in all sorts of ways. I'm really curious about the accuracies of those depictions mm -hmm. and like what people don't know about black holes. Yeah, so Vatana, if you could actually explain what it is a black hole is for people who are not familiar or are a little rusty on what black holes are. So the basic thing I would use to define a black hole is it kind of needs a backup definition of an escape velocity. So the reason a rocket ship can leave the Earth's gravitational pull, but I can't if I'm jumping, is that the rocket ship has a velocity high enough to surpass some threshold set by the Earth's gravity, an escape velocity. So anything traveling above this velocity can leave the Earth's gravitational field. And that velocity is determined by basically how massive, how much mass, and how big an object is. So a black hole is an object for which the escape velocity surpasses the speed of light. And the speed of light is kind of the universal speed limit on everything. Nothing can travel faster than light in a vacuum. So if the escape velocity of this object is larger than the speed of light, nothing can leave it once it enters. So would you call it a singularity? So a singularity is kind of what the term we use to describe the center of a black hole. Structurally, you can kind of give it two parts. So there's the event horizon, which is an imaginary shell that defines the distance from the center at which the escape velocity is the speed of light. So that's like the boundary, the, the point of no return. So anything past the event horizon can't get back out. And then the singularity is the center of the black hole, the point of infinite density. That's a super, super cool that like the, the consequence of these definitions are then these like the things that we can visualize. Um, we mentioned the event horizon, like the way black holes I've seen depicted in film, almost like a disk, right? But the, you said a shell, so it's more, it's a sphere. Yeah, it would be a, a radially or spherically symmetric object, uh, just for the same reasons that most things in space planets, stars, black holes, they're all spheres, right? Just uh, uh, 
a result of the fact that gravity is symmetric and how things collapse just gives you lots of spheres. Yeah, and it's, it's essentially so dead stars uh, of a certain mass can create black holes. Uh, so that is one formation uh, track, I suppose you could say, for one type of black hole. And that's exactly that, that the most massive stars, when they uh, run through all of their fuel and no longer have uh, energy to support the, or to push back against the gravity that's been pulling down towards their centers, they eventually can collapse into a black hole. Okay, and so where are the, what are the other types of black holes? So that, the, the star dying, is a stellar mass black hole because it tends to have masses similar to the masses of stars. But you can also have supermassive black holes uh, which tend to reside in the centers of galaxies. And these can be over millions of times the mass of the sun. Uh, also, I've been saying solar masses. That means one sun mass, just in case that I have been throwing too much jargon at no, you. No, no, this has been great. I feel like this is a good like uh, refresher for everyone. Uh, some people are more familiar with black holes than others, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's always new research and new things coming out about black holes, uh, which actually brings me to like, how long have we known ab about black holes? So the earliest kind of real idea of a black hole, uh, people had proposed objects from which light can't escape, uh, maybe as early as the 1700s, but it really came to a head with Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, uh, where he proposed this completely uh, radical way of thinking about gravity. And there are many, many different things that kind of popped out of this theory, one of which or black holes. And so that was in the early, like the early part of the, the 20th century. Um, and there has been plenty of work between then and now in the theory of black holes. And it wasn't until way closer to the end of the last century that we actually started uh, detecting things that we would now consider black holes. Yeah, so I, about the detecting, you know, one of the movies we, we watched uh, to sort of dive into how black holes are depicted in pop culture was The Black Hole from 1979, the right. Disney movie. Uh, you know, was there anything you think around the 70s that may have, like, been a catalyst for Disney wanting to make a movie around black holes? Were there just more scientific papers coming out? Or? Maybe it was just right after the space race, mm -hmm. you know, everybody, lots of national pride in going to space and it's the final frontier and lots of excitement about this new unknown thing that we were finally starting to go into physically instead of just thinking about and looking at. Uh, I imagine that could have had a lot to do with it. Yeah. I mean, for me, it feels like black holes are something that we, uh, even though I don't know how much we know about it now versus the 70s, but there still feels like there's so much unknowable. Oh, there's so much. Everything, right? not everything, but a lot of it is pretty unknown. And, and that makes it really ripe for science fiction because yeah. to know, to infer that something can exist and have these properties based on these theories, but then still not know so much, then makes it a fun thing to speculate about, especially when right. you have something this massive that you can easily say, oh, it is a, like a black sphere that no one can never know what's on the other side. That's fun. Yeah, right. well, like in the movie, they I think they were saying uh, in the Black Hole movie, they were talking about how space and time no longer exist inside. But do we actually know if that's the case? <laughs> so, OK, so here's the, the problem with studying black holes and trying to say anything about them, particularly internal to the event horizon. So as I said already, a black hole is a thing from which light cannot escape. Light that is captured from something else or if it is, you know, its own light, it couldn't escape from it, right? So it is inherently dark, right? And in astronomy, the way we learn about things is by looking at light, right? When you look at the sky, all you see is the, the pinpricks of light from stars. We look at that light in great detail, the amount of light, what color the light is, how it's moving, how it's changing. But ultimately, we need light to understand things. Now, there are a couple uh, exceptions to this, things like neutrinos and more recently gravitational waves, which I'm sure we'll get into in due time. Uh, but the vast majority of astronomical information is gathered through looking at light. So how do you understand a thing that doesn't have light, right? It, it just isn't giving us any information. There's a boundary to the information we can possibly extract from this, which means that screenwriters and, and novelists can kind of say whatever they want and I, nobody can really say they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> it's this interesting like realm of total creativity where there's, I mean, there's, there's speculations about, you know, wor wormholes and, and all of these uh, exotic ideas, but 
something to realize maybe is that there's the category of information we have a black hole, about black holes that we can kind of verify, and then there's the theories. Uh, and, and all of the things that you see past uh, entry into black holes fall into the theories. And there are th some theories that are more scientifically based than others, but uh, definitely all still def definitively within the realm of speculation. Right. Well, and, you know, something in which I see black holes get depicted uh, a lot, um, whether it's movies or TV or, or what have you, is that they get a very bad rap or, or they're very evil or it's like, you know, they're the most destructive force right. in the universe and they're going to kill everything in their path and maybe the entire universe is going to get sucked into a black hole, uh, you know, but... You know, I have seen some uh, stuff around black holes around how they might, you know, actually help create things or they might actually be healthy for galaxies to have since there's a super massive black hole in most galaxies sure. and things of that nature. Are, are there ways in which you think black holes are actually a healthy part of galaxies or? or... Well, before getting to healthiness, just to debunk some of the, the ideas that they just go around gobbling up everything, right? Uh, I think one of the, the little facts I always pull out that surprise people is that if right now our sun that we're orbiting turned into a black hole of the same mass, we would keep going around it the way we are now. It would be pretty dark and we'd probably die from the lack of energy that we're receiving that we're very reliant on pretty soon. But in terms of the Earth's motion, it wouldn't immediately get sucked in it would continue orbiting this newly created hypothetical black hole. Because even though black holes have uh, this, these extreme gravitational properties when you get close into them, at a distance, they still behave like any other object with mass. So mm -hmm. planets orbit stars, and uh, uh, stars orbit each other. And sometimes you can have a star and a black hole orbiting each other. And that's a completely... Uh, maybe not super common, but not a surprising thing to see at all. Um, so they're, they're not as, as uh, aggressively violent <laughs> as people tend to think, where they're going out of their way. They kind of just sit where they are and interact in, in, in ways that other objects tend to, in some cases. Uh, now, like you were saying about supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, this class of supermassive black holes that weigh millions or hundreds of millions of, or even billions of times the mass of the sun uh, reside in the center of most galaxies. And uh, you can imagine, again, this things orbiting each other. All the stars in a galaxy orbit around this central supermassive black hole. Um, but in addition to stars orbiting the black hole, you can often have other materials, so like gas, dust that accumulates in, in galaxies, also orbiting these black holes in what's called an accretion disk. An accretion disk is a, basically if you had a black hole right here, you could imagine kind of like a drain, everything swirling into it on a disk. Mm -hmm. And this is just the stream of gas and dust and other particles coming in really, really, really fast. One thing to keep in mind is just like the escape velocity of a black hole is the speed of light, that means that things falling into it will be traveling close to that speed once they come in. So you have all of these really rapidly moving particles generating lots of heat, emitting lots of radiation, and this radiation actually does a lot to power processes in the galaxy, such as star formation. Oh, and, and the things happening right outside the event horizon, things we can observe, how much of that informs what we think or what we know about oh, black holes? Oh, it and... informs a lot. So one of the ways in which people can point to a galaxy, a, a galaxy that might just be a few pixels in your little image that you're trying to look at and say something meaningful about, uh, the, even if you can't see this supermassive black hole, because obviously, we, we, as I said before, you can't see the black hole. You look at the effects that it has on things around it. So you can look at the, the orbital dynamics of everything else in the galaxy and see maybe uh, you might look at as a function of how close you are to the center, how quickly our star is moving. And that can tell you the mass of the thing that they must be orbiting. So by looking at dynamics in galaxies, people can say, okay, that galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center with a mass of blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so, well, I have to ask you, you know, we're going a bit into the science of black holes, but so what, what were your thoughts on how it was depicted in uh, the 1979 film of, you know, they go into the black hole and 
Well, uh, they or have even a before journey. they go into yeah. the black hole, uh, yeah. when they talk about you know this ship with anti gravity field yes. and being able to yeah, there's sustain a ship itself that outside. can like outrun the the black hole's pull and right. So anti gravity field statically, <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. The <laughs> idea that I, I think that if I'm getting this correct from the movie is that they're pushing against it, so they're like constantly running away from it. Um, or at least I, maybe I'm being generous. That's what I think they would want to try. <laughs> um, so just like we had established the idea of escape velocity, right at the event horizon, it would be close. It would be the speed of light. A little bit far away from it, it would, it would be very, very high. But maybe something that in the sci-fi world is an attainable speed, like 90% mm -hmm. the speed of light or something like that, depending on how far away they are. So I guess what they're doing in the movie is saying, here's the black hole and here's us. And we're traveling that way fast enough to be pulling against or, or counteracting the pull of the black hole, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with um, fine. It's a, it's, it's an, it's an ambitious technological feat, uh, but there's nothing to say that if you had the capacity to reach speeds like that, that you couldn't do that. Though, realistically, other things might come in your way before even crossing the event horizon. Before we continue on with this week's episode, I want to let you know that Offworld is made possible with support from Emerald Code on Sorta TV, an amazing show for teachers and parents. We know how hard it can be to get the younger people in your life to embrace STEM fields, especially young women. Emerald Code is a series that really focuses on helping younger people grow their interest in STEM by showing how they can use these concepts to solve problems in real life. The series provides great role models for young people who might be a bit shy about stepping into scientific communities they're interested in. Check out Sorta TV for lots more STEM content, like their DIY experiment show, Stemily and Decoded, which focuses on real girls making a difference in STEM fields. Subscribe to the Sorta TV channel at youtube.com slash Sorta TV, or if you're watching the video, by clicking the links in the description below. Once again, that's youtube.com slash S-O-R-T-A TV. Now back to the conversation. Right. Well, so we also uh, have, you know, just the depictions generally of, of black holes over time. So in this uh, 79 film, you know, it sort of looks like a swirling galaxy. Mm -hmm. But then you've, you know, you jump uh, several uh, uh, years and decades ahead to Interstellar, mm -hmm. which like put a lot of effort and, and science advising into what a black hole might look like if you get up close to it. And mm -hmm. so you see more to sort of the uh, accretion disk that you're talking about in front of it. Do you think that we're getting closer to depicting what might be going on in a black hole? Do you think sci-fi is paying more attention to the actual physics involved? Or yeah. do you think we're still kind of far off in, in how we depict it? So Interstellar was a really cool case. So as I'm sure you know, Kip Thorne was the like science consultant. Uh, and he, I think he and somebody else had originally written the movie in a form that isn't what it became, but it was in, initially um, they were trying really, really hard to keep it true to what is physically possible. Maybe not technologically possible currently, but within the realms of what physics allows, right? And so this was really interesting. He, he wrote a whole book on the science of interstellar and, and I, I read it back when the movie came out. And one of the things that really struck me was that the depictions like visually of the black hole uh, in, the, in the case of the, the movie it's a it's a wormhole right so the idea is that you enter the black hole next to jupiter to get into the wormhole on one side and pop out somewhere else and there's something else on that other side it's like a different point in space not some other universe but just the other side of this universe you know and so what they did to depict the black hole was they're like okay so here's the view you would see on the other side now let's warp that view, like take that picture that you would have seen on the other side of the wormhole and distort it in a mathematically rigorous way based on Einstein's equations of relativity and how, uh, how or all these since developed uh, theories on how wormholes would function uh, and, you know, meticulously calculate what that would look like on the other side. So what you see when you look at the black hole in Interstellar is a projection of what would be on the other side through a wormhole, which is 
honestly, the fact that not even that, but specifically through a wormhole and then into an IMAX camera, <laughs> taking into account the optics of the camera itself and things like lens flares and all that. Uh, lens glares? Lens flares? I don't know things about cameras. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so they, so they go into all that detail just for the visual of the black hole, not even like the, the, the story or what it does or the time dilation and all that, but just for the image. They were like building these like ray tracing programs that's just really, really elaborate. So I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it because I've seen it sort of copied. I think like a recent uh, episode of Star Trek Discovery actually mm. had a black hole that looked very similar to mm. Interstellar's version of black holes. So I'm hoping like, all that hard work will like go into like paying off for like having uh, more accurate movies and TV shows in the future. Until the next big ambitious movie wants to crunch the math again and, and show their portrayal. You mentioned um, time dilation and it's something that's, um, I've always wondered, uh, as you get closer to say the event horizon, you're moving closer to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So relatively speaking, um, the way you experience time there would be potentially different than people further away. Yeah. How, how does that work and what does that, I mean, I, I've heard the theory that, you know, as you get close, you see the end of the universe because everything else is moving right. so, so much slower for you. Basically, there is a um, effect of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity that says that uh, when you're in very, very, very strong gravitational fields, the way time flows can be distorted. Right. So the the idea here is that if you are close to a black hole, for you, the passage of time goes more slowly. So this is why in the movie, Matthew McConaughey's character uh, comes towards, you know, he goes to that planet that's near the black hole. Uh, and then he, when they go back, everybody is much older. Time has passed. So for everybody uh, on board that ship that came close to the black hole, time just slowed down because of the present, you know, their proximity to the black hole. Um, and it seems pretty outlandish, but that's actually a very uh, rigorously tested, theoretically supported idea that we, we kind of uh, classify as true at this point. Um, so the time dilation as seen in Interstellar is that sort of was the time differences kind of just convenient for movie making purposes or were they on the order of the actual time dilation that you might have around a black hole? I don't know if that's yeah. getting into too many specifics. So, no, it's actually apparently uh, if you had a black hole of whatever mass it was in the movie and you, you calibrated its spin just correctly, I think that was a critical thing in getting that to be realistic that it would have to be a rotating black hole, then you could have a planet nearby it that was in a stable orbit that experienced that amount of time dilation. Apparently, it was a point of contention between uh, Christopher Nolan and Kip Thorne, where he's like, I want it to be seven years for one hour. And Kip Thorne's like, no, that doesn't work. And he's like, go do the calculations. And he did. And he's like, oh, OK, I just need to make it spin. Um, God, yeah, just yeah, make give me the variables. Give me the you. factors yeah. That, yeah. that work mathematically. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, um, so we have these kind of bookends in, in the pop culture portrayals, right? From 1979 to, um, to Interstellar, what was that, 20, 20, 14, 2014? 2014. Yeah. Right. Um, is there a renewed interest or more information oh, yeah. about black holes since oh, yeah. then? What, what's the... One of the most notable discoveries, in physics at least, in this century so far, is the detection of gravitational waves. So I'll probably get into the details of this, but baseline, when two black holes are rotating around each other and they eventually collide in, right before, when they're in spiraling, they release gravitational waves, which are like ripples through space and time itself that we measured in 2015 for the first time. Yeah, no, I was so, extremely, right. extremely excited so about So just a year after Interstellar came out, all this excitement about it, about a black hole in a movie, we had this completely groundbreaking, revolutionary discovery in physics that is fundamentally changing the way we can start to study black holes that Einstein predicted 100 years ago that we're only now seeing for the first time. 
So, and since that first gravitational wave detection of that first black hole mergers, I think there have been uh, a handful more that have been um, discovered and people are building more and more of these specific types of uh, instruments that can detect these gravitational waves. And so this is, there's no way to under, to oversell how much of a, a change this is in the way astronomy is done. Uh, because just like I was saying, light earlier is the only way we know everything. Not well, anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We have a, it's like we could see before and now we could hear. So it's it's really going to change the game a lot. Yeah, I, I am endlessly fascinated with how we actually detect gravitational waves. And uh, it's essentially like with uh, LIGO and the other mm -hmm. detectors is like all we do is we put very careful measuring tape and we just wait around for a wave to kind of pass through. And then we see basically a, a, we see the measuring tape uh, like if we're measuring a room, we see that room grow by like what, like a quarter of a neutron or something half a neutron, like something that. like that. It's amazing that yeah. we're like actually detecting it just by detecting like right. Use actual laser space. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's really cool. So is that, you know, I know that's like an extremely exciting area of um, black hole research uh, and, and really opens up a lot. Is there anything that you're looking at uh, now that's really exciting you now that we've detected gravitational waves? So my like my in in the research sense my research is pretty far removed from that type of of black hole detection i do a, a completely different thing in order to look for black holes however i will say that i've spent a lot of time since then sitting around with friends saying okay gravitational waves are a thing how can we use them what are they going to become like i feel like this is such a ripe uh area for sci-fi in the future just because it's a it's a whole nother thing that we've just not really considered before. Like, what does what what happens when a civilization can create gravitational waves? And could you you know use them as the basis for technology? Like, think of how much of modern technology is kind of being able to manipulate electromagnetic fields. What if we could manipulate gravitational fields? Like, it's it just for a mental exercise, fun thought experiment perspective it's something I, I like to think about a lot but uh it's unfortunately not very related to the the actual work I do oh but it's fun to think about and I feel like that creativity will ultimately inspire you to sort of think about new ways of looking at things and I think that's what's really awesome about science fiction and and having black holes in science fiction is because even as we discover more about them there's just so much left that we don't know. Right. And that's the exciting part. It is yeah. very exciting. 30 years later, we could look back at Interstellar the same way we're looking back at <laughs> the black hole. Exactly. Right. And, and put in front of that. Are, there, are there things that you just kind of are, were done with in terms of depictions of black hole in science fiction? Let's no longer talk about them as wormholes or things that you really want to see in the spacefaring aspect. I mean, so I feel like wormholes were cool for sci-fi because it's just such an interesting plot device, the same way time travel is such an interesting plot device, even though neither are things that are like very feasible. Um, but I think there are areas of research that could kind of be interesting uh, to people developing sci-fi. Like I was, I was at a conference recently where me and a couple other uh, people who are attended who also presented their research on literally a table of people who look for black holes, right? Uh, and we were just sitting around thinking like, okay, if we wanted to like write a book describing the thing that we, I, I study basically it's called gravitational lensing. It's when, it's another gravitational effect, not uh, time dilation or anything like that, but black holes can warp light traveling around them. And I basically look for that warped light. So we're sitting around saying, okay, there's this, there's this thing we all study. How could we like, what angle could we use to make it interesting? Like, could you make a weapon that's a gravitational lens? Could you like have a civilization like artificially making lens situations in order to achieve some technological goal? Could you? So it's, it's, it's again, just that kind of head in the air speculation, like, huh, that would be interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like I'm forgetting what the actual question is. I feel like we need more filmmakers <laughs> yeah. listening to people like you no, exactly. to come up with new ideas so that we can have more interesting science fiction yeah, stories. Yeah, endlessly just fascinating area. Well, thank you so much for being on the show thank today. Thank you for having me. It was super fun. I don't know if it shows, but I 
basically love talking about this stuff to anybody who will listen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it makes all my friends and family pretty annoyed, probably, but we love it. I'm, I'm glad this is the right place for me. Then. <laughs> yeah, we're all geeks here. Great. I love it. Okay, so we dove into a lot of different aspects of black holes, uh, time dilation, we jumped into whether or not there are worlds inside black holes, why people even imagine in the first place that there's worlds inside black holes. And it just comes down to the fact that we don't know a whole lot. But what's really exciting is gravitational waves and all this stuff that's going to be bringing through just way more information about black holes over the coming decades. So it's kind of the renaissance of what we could imagine black holes are or what they're like if we were to encounter them in outer space. And we ended with, you know, how can storytellers really make use of that? And that's really the big question, right? We have these kind of tried and true depictions and plot devices using black holes. But I think going forward, everyone from researchers to pop culture fans included would love to see this mysterious object and an idea of being taken in different directions. Yeah, actually, I, in the comments, I'd be interested to hear all of you what you have to say about what you would like to see depicted in films or TV or even books about I don't know what it would be like to interact with black holes or how we could have more interesting stories around black holes in the future. Or if you know of a great story that does involve a black hole, we'd love to hear that suggestion as well. Uh, you can catch Off World as a video on YouTube, but also as audio only as a podcast at tested.com slash Off World. And we'll be back next time with another episode.